what is dataism? Now I've I've spoke about this before, but dataism is a philosophy, or according to Yuval Noah Harari, a and in fact a religion. And the dataism was actually first uh, coined by David Brooks of the New York Times, but it's got much much uh, popular after Yuval Noah Harari wrote about it in his Homo Deus uh, book. Dataism is a philosophy slash religion that has three basic tenets. The first one declares that all the universe consists of data flows. The only thing that really exists is data flowing in all types of things. So uh, this leads to the second one. The importance of any phenomenon then is determined by its contribution to data processing. And number three, all biological life are algorithms that process data. And so this is where Yuval Noah Harari talks about how dataism is basically the <laughs> the bastard child, if you will, between contemporary biology and computer science. And so computer science is obviously very much interested in data and processing, processing information, processing large, uh, large sets of data, and that many people in contemporary biology in the, in the academy have adopted this understanding for a definition of what biological life is. It is then the processing of data. You then, as, as he claims, you are an, you're in a biological algorithm. You have no soul. You have no, and we'll get into the, the, there is no importance to human experience. There is no such thing as love. All these things are biochemical uh, processes. Uh, the mind or consciousness is an emergent property. You as a biological entity really aren't that important. And the only reason humanity was important was because they could process more data. They were a better biological algorithm than a lion, than a plant, than a tree. And so for these people, synthesizing Darwinian Wallace theory of evolution with contemporary theories in, in computer science have posited an all-encompassing new philosophy. And so this philosophy is not postmodern, though it is post-human. What do I mean by that? Postmodern has to do with really the only thing that exists are power structures because the universality of truth or the existence of objective truth has totally gone away with. This is the postmodern turn in the academy during the 20th century. This is where we see somebody like a Michel Foucault only interested in power uh, knowledge, the knowledge based on power dynamics, meaning knowledge is all about who's in power and maintaining that power. And this this Marxist sort of interpretation of everything leads to a focusing on power dynamics. Well, dataism, despite it coming out of the World Economic Forum with Dr. Klaus Schwab and Yuval Noah Harari, it's not postmodern. It's not postmodern. It is posthuman because it entirely rejects any sort of humanistic framework that understands you as a unique individual made in the image of God, having a soul. Uh, being uniquely creative, all these different things, rejects all of that. The only thing it interprets is data. That's the only thing that matters. And this is why I framed it as Gnostic. Gnostic in the sense of that sort of competing heretical form of Christianity that focused on the acquisition of spiritual gnosis, knowledge, and that as we acquire more knowledge, we become more illuminated. Well, this, in a way, ties very much with dataism. Because as we'll talk, and the reason why Yuval Noah Harari explicitly states it as a religion is because what is being created, what he calls a sort of internet of all things, and this is basically another way for him to talk about an AI processing God, he literally talks about it, is that this is what's going to, in a way, set us free from our biological limitations, that humanity as we know it, he believes by 2050, will no longer exist, that humanity is going to merge itself with the internet of all things, whether it be your smart stove, your smartphone, um, your electric car. There's an emphasis for him and his worldview, especially for dataism, why everything needs to be on the electric grid, because then all that power, all that data can be processed. And it's not processed by biological entities. And that's where he, he argues that dataism is really the first novel philosophical or theological turn since humanism, because humanism challenged the role of God, right? So humanism 
created a sort of new anthropology in which man is no longer tied to being the image of God or the steward of creation. He is just a rational entity, the most rational entity on the planet. And therefore, he needs to use his reason and, and using the scientific method or whatnot to celebrate sort of uh, liberalness and, and the elevation of human creativity and freedom and expression and all this different stuff, right? So humanism sort of displaces God and puts man there. Well, he's saying what we're doing now is we're moving to a data-centric worldview. And whether you agree with it or not, it's too late, according to him. It's too late. You've already lost. You have no power. Or do you have a social media account? Do you have a smartphone? Do you have an online banking account? You've already lost. Dataism is already in the rule. It's already ruling us. And so dataism is a philosophy slash religion that is one declares that the universe consists of data flowing in, in a multitude of directions in different ways. Therefore, the importance of any phenomenon is determined by its contribution to data processing. Now you can, and we'll get into why our advanced artificial intelligence is so important, because how are they going to sift through all the data? Well, you're going to need something that can process and sift through data much more than a biological entity can do. And this is where he argues why bio biology is antiquated. You, bi humans, as a, as a homocentric, um, you know, homo sapien centric worldview, humanism, talking about the 17th and 18th century. Well, you guys, we, we can't process data anymore. Therefore, we're moving to technology. We're, you, we're moving to algorithms. And we're going to see how he literally is going to talk about the algorithm. Basically, you are going to transport all your critical thinking, uh, the knowledge of yourself, your desires, like we'll get to it. He literally in this book advocates that in the future, uh, when you want to find out who you're going to marry, what your career is, what you should do with your life, how you're going to live, well, you'll just ask the algorithm. Because the algorithm is going to detect every single click, everything you've liked, every website you've gone to, every single purchase you've ever made, a la central bank digital currencies. Does it make a little bit more sense? And therefore, the algorithm is going to know you better than you can know you. And he talks about, and this is where he's talking about the religion of daddy. He says, know thyself. Well, know thyself. He says, the algorithm is going to know yourself better than you could ever know yourself. And so... All biological, uh, the third one was then all biological life or algorithms to process data. data. Dataism, as I said, is the negation of any humanist values. It is, it is seen itself as a sort of turn from humanism. And this is where we could characterize it as a post-human worldview. I've talked about the sort of central pillars of transhumanism. And I've talked about uh, post-humanism, post-secularism, dataism, uh, post-Darwinism. Because Darwinism and natural selection insinuates that there's there's environmental factors that are choosing to selecting genes, right? Well, moving forward, we're going to select our own genes. We're going to use CRISPR. We're going to use technology. We're going to use algorithms to perfect the human DNA. And so humans are no longer the process of all the data. Therefore, they should depend on external algorithms. Again, algorithms to choose who your spouse should be, algorithms to choose how you should live your life, algorithms that tell you who to vote for. Although he talks about democracy is going away. We don't need democracy anymore. And I have a clip of Klaus Schwab literally telling you that in the future, an AI is gonna, tell, is gonna rule the world. You're not gonna be able to vote. There is no voting in the future. That makes a little bit more sense why 2020 occurred make a little bit more sense why the social media companies won't let you talk about that. And so he talks about how the idea before where we would privilege human experience, the fact that people would go climb mountains or go watch whales or, or go spend time with their friends and have good conversations. He says that's, that's no longer important because the only thing that's important is data. And so the only thing is important if you go climb a mountain or you go watch whales it's not important how you experienced, how you felt, how it changed your perspective. The only thing is important is that you uploaded, you, you shared it, and you made it public because the data, the processing of information is then what is acquiring the knowledge of your going whale watching or what mountain you climbed or what friends you were with. He says, we don't, again, that's humanism. That's a focus on humanism, this homo sapien centric worldview that you're 
personal human experience would matter at all. Nobody cares anymore. The only thing that is of importance is that you share all data pertaining to your life, which includes DNA. So he advocates, hey, you want to you want to you want to help the future? Go get your DNA sequence. In fact, go get your mother and your father's DNA sequence, too. And if your grandparents are alive, make sure you get their DNA so that we can sequence them as well. And he advocates for biometric wearables, whether it be your Apple smartphone or your um, your whoop or whatever it may be, your, your, the, the rings that they have now. But because he says, well, once you put all that, that medical data, once you put all that health data, your heart rate, all this stuff, it's, now it's in a smartphone. Now it's tied to the internet. Now it's tied to the internet of all things. And this is then this growing entity, which is this futuristic God of dataism. And so data is the most important above all else. OK, so human experiences, as I said, human experiences, that's antiquated. National governments, that's antiquated. We're not doing any national governments in the future. He specifically talks about how the difference, the differences between capitalism and communism. And he's not really making a preference on any one way in which the society runs. His, his only point is that dataism adopts a similar framework from capitalism in regards to free markets. Because dataism is essential on the free flow of information. That is the number, number one thing. And we're going to get into like, what are the sins of the data God religion? It's, it's not allowing the sharing of your information of data. Like he literally talks about in the future, if you wrote a book, you're not going to be able to sell the book for money because that insinuates a paywall between the information and the consumer everything's going to have to be for free. There will be no financial incentive. Why? Because it's about the free flowing of data. And so whatever work you create, whatever book you write, it's going to have to be uploaded and published for free so that, again, it can be accessed and that data then can be assumed back into the sort of AI God that they're talking about. So things that are antiquated, human experiences, national governments, human creativity, they're no longer important. These are these are again. He advocates these are things that we need to no longer focus on. This is this is 20th century thinking. 21st century thinking is all about the processing of information, and so this data centric model, as I said, is entirely post human. What is the anthropology of people? All you are is a biological algorithm, and therefore the transitioning of you from a bio, a purely biological entity to a uh, to a cyborg into fully transhuman. It's just, it's just a matter of your ability to process information. It has nothing. There is no such thing as, as, as a purely biological or well, that anything purely biological would be beneficial or better than something that is uh, augmented, has some type of augmented reality. It doesn't matter. The only thing that is important is your ability to process information. So putting a brain chip in you, that's essential. You're not going to have a choice. As he he literally says, and I've talked about this in previous streams, by 2050, there will be, he argues, there will be no fully biological entities because the system isn't going to let people not be connected to it. And I'm going to get that when I get down to the three commandments of dataism. So humans should then not listen to intuition. He, he specifically says this idea that people want to listen to their intuition or they want to pray and meditate and sort of develop this sort of interior uh, conscience. He says, no longer. We're not doing that anymore. The inner self, he says, but instead we need to refer back to the internet of all things. We need to refer back to the algorithms. He's very explicit that the algorithms are not even going to run society. They're going to run your life. They're like your magical genie. Again, everything, all your creativity, all your wants and desires are, are basically exported to the algorithm. And the algorithm decides all. And that algorithm is tied to another algorithm. And it's all going to be tied to what he considers this, this massively advanced artificial intelligence. And you say, oh, wow, so he thinks this thing's going to become conscience. No, not really. Not really, because part of the dadist philosophy is that it separates biology from culture and it separates intelligence from consciousness. So anybody who's familiar with the philosophy of mind knows that what's called the hard problem in the philosophy of mind has to do with uh, defining and, and explaining of the existence of consciousness or the mind. Right. The mind is not the same thing as the brain unless you are 
somebody who argues for like an emergent property, which is what he argues that consciousness is basically an emergent property of biochemistry. Well, he's not interested in solving the hard problem. So he says, what, how we've got around this is that we don't give a shit about consciousness. The only thing that is real is processing, and therefore he considers it intelligent. And intelligence is the ability to record, re recognize patterns, and that the advanced artificial intelligence will be able to recognize all patterns. And when I get into the last part, I want to analyze the paradigm. This is the epistemology, because this is why censoring people OK, we can look back to 2020. What happened in 2020 and then 2021, a sort of medical procedure came out and it was highly advocated for. And people who put out warnings, say like Dr. Malone or or various figures, you know, Dr. McCullough, they got censored. Well, he says, yeah, that's fine. That's fine, because even the experimentation of medical procedures on the world is more data. So even if you die, not a big deal. That's just more data we can acquire. We want to. We definitely want to know if you did it or if you didn't do it, so that we can process that data. We don't care what happened to you. There's already too many people on the planet, so humans should not listen to their intuition or what he calls their inner selves anymore. But instead, they should focus on the internet of all things and the algorithm. Algorithms, he argues, will know you better than you could ever know yourself. And they have this thing where uh, this was tied to even the breach in data with the, uh, what was it, Cambridge Analytica back uh, during the Trump, uh, well, the run for presidency in, in 2016. Cambridge Analytica had basically brokered a deal with Facebook to get all the, the, the data of various people's profiles. And there's this argument, which again, dataism was already in full effect. The tech world already believes in this philosophy, this dataism, that they said, well, if we know 10, 10, if we can get 10 of your likes from Facebook, we kind of know you like a coworker. If we can get 30 of your likes, we know you as sort of a, you know, maybe you go out for drinks, kind of a friend. If we can get 50 to 100 likes, we know you like a really intimate friend or a parent. And if we can get 300 of your likes, the algorithm's going to know so much about you that again, it begins to know you better than you can know you. And that's where then Facebook was literally selling that data. So isn't it ironic that the Silicon Valley and these people that believe in dataism, they're going to make it illegal for you to sell data, whether it be a book, whether it be your DNA sequence, whether it be your own personal opinions, whether it be where you're at in the world on social media, that will absolutely be free so that these these algorithms, these AI systems, these social media companies can process and filter all that data. And of course, then they sell your data because what are we? We're in it. We're in an economy of information, right? We're in the information age and dataism is absolutely the philosophy and religion of the 21st century because it's all about information. That's the only thing that exists. And so he says, you're going to need to get your DNA sequenced. And this is something, you know, a lot of us have wanted to do the Ancestry.com or the 23andMe. And we've heard rumors, you know, wow, why is it that China subsidizes like 23andMe? Why is it now, what was it, BlackRock just bought 23andMe or, or Ancestry.com or one of those two? Why, why do they want that so much? Because that's data. And data is power in the future. So this is the difference between a Marxist framework that's focusing on economics or some of these postmodern philosophies. Dataism isn't interested in that. Dataism is focused on data and that that's the only thing that exists. And in in that which can process more has more power. And this is the dynamics of the world. So what is the religion of data in this AI God? Well, it like I said, it's the Internet of all things. It's and you guys have probably read books about the Internet of all things. This has been a phrase that has been quite popular for a while now. But um, the Internet of all things is everything that is, quote unquote, smart. Right. Because it connects to the Internet. And he talks about the Internet of all things. This is your stovetop. This is your refrigerator. This is your smartphone. This is your biometric wearable device. This is everything. This is your social media. All this stuff is smart. It's online and it's going to be then processing. It's sending data out into the internet, which then can be uh, acquired and filtered by this AI system, this advanced artificial intelligence. And 
this is going to be a godlike system that can spread through the entirety of the universe. So he talks about, you know, all these religions have talked about, uh, well, he uses Hinduism. We know how Hinduism believes in the, the Atman, the soul, that's Hindu Sanskrit for soul. Well, you know, in Dadaism, we believe that, you know, because Hinduism believes that through moksha, through samsara, right? Samsara is the releasing from the cycle of death and rebirth. Moksha then is your soul, your Atman blending with the cosmic Atman, the, the, the cosmic soul, okay? So he says, yeah, that's basically like Dadaism, except you don't have a soul. You're just, your ability to process information is going to be merging into the, the corporate God AI system. And he talks about how we'll be able to send things out into the universe, out into the galaxies, all through ecosystems. Everything is going to be part of the internet of all things. So when we talk about smart computers and smart refrigerators, he's saying, yeah, that's what it is now. But he's talking about every tree on the planet, every river on the planet, every every ecosystem, every single person, every single car, everything is going to be tied to the internet of all things so that all data can be processed. And this is what's going to give it a godlike ability. And so it talks about how humans will, like I said, merge with this entity. This is where the transhumanism comes in because, and this is where we can talk about even contemporary things in culture, like the debate regarding how many genders there are. Transgenderism, as I've talked about before in regards to the philosophy of transhumanism, is an essential correlate because as we look at philosophers like Max Moore and Natasha Vitamore, two very prominent transhumanist philosophers, they talk about how, yeah, of course we're in favor of all that stuff because that creates bodily autonomy, meaning you can now amalgamate and reconfigure and, and, and construct new identities, right? New identities. And this is leading to then the recategorization of what is a person, because eventually this is going to move to a full cyborg, somebody who's fully transhuman. This is all part of, of sort of embracing a larger category for what it means to be human, because human, as he said, dataism breaks down the distinction between man and animal, and it breaks down the distinction between man and machine, because it's all about data. It's all about the processing of information. And so this entity will be able to exert its will onto the entirety of the cosmos. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? So this, this abstract, technological, non-personal uh, entity that doesn't believe in love, right? Yes, they don't believe in love. So they believe love is purely just a biochemical, that it's going to be able to exert its will onto the entirety of the cosmos, and this is why he said this is why dataism is actually going to fulfill all the world religions because the coming of Christ or or the idea that we're going to merge with the cosmic soul this is just dataism this is just the ai god coming into fruition and it's going to be able to save and rescue humanity uh, in due course and so there are three commandments that he lists as regards to uh, well, I consider them commandments, but he talks about it in regards to dataism. There are three things that are essential to it. Number one is the maximization of personal data flow. Every individual must be linked to the overall unit. So what is that about? He's talking about medical records, <clears throat> health passports, medical records, your social media, your financial system, <clears throat> central bank digital currencies. These things are essential to making sure that humans are hooked up to the to the processor, basically, to the AI system. Because what you are, again, whether you live or not, it, it doesn't matter. There's already too many people, according to them, on the planet. But what you do is you're always processing information through your likes, your clicks, whether you laugh at something or you hate something. All of it is a processing of information. And so once you process it, you've made a decision. You then can contribute that data to this thing that can, one, know about you, but then know about your people, your local community, your the global community, all this other stuff. And so he says there's three commandments. Number one is we must maximize personal data flow. Every single person must be connected to the system. Number two, it must link everything to the system. This is where, okay, number one, all people must be linked to the system. Number two is all things, 
all things must be linked to the system. We're talking smartphones. We're talking stovetops. We're talking refrigerators. We're talking all animals. He's talking about, he mentioned that he wants the entirety of ecosystems to be online, meaning every tree in the Amazon rainforest is somehow contributing data to this AI system. And so smartphones, stovetops, animals, ecosystems, so that the system can regulate, as he talks about, the entire universe. Because the AI system is going to regulate the universe. Because, as he argues, finally God is actually here. And number three, this is the sin. This is the ultimate sin in dataism. Is you can never disconnect or block the flow of data. The greatest sin is disconnecting from the system or blocking the free flow of data. And this is why I said, he says in the future, ideally by 2040, 2050, yeah, you write a book, you can't sell it for money. We'll all have universal basic incomes. We'll all have an, an allocated amount of money that we're able to have. It's all going to be a digital currency. It's all going to be centralized. It's all going to be connected. And whatever you create has to be for free so that all that data can be collected. You're not going to be allowed to have a paywall. You're not going to allow to have medical privacy, private communities, private communication private property. No, these things aren't going to exist in the future. You see, that's all 20th century stuff. And he's explicit about this. And so the next point I want to make is that freedom is for the data. It's not for you. So when we talk about freedom, he brings up freedom multiple times in this book, but it's never about freedom in regards to freedom of human creativity, freedom of speech, right? This is a big one with Elon Musk and, and X now or Twitter. And I've, and I've talked about this over, I think a year and a half ago, I was really, really skeptical of Elon Musk and told people that, look, do not think that he's some savior Him buying Twitter. I mean, I believe Elon Musk believes in dataism. And if he does, well, then the allowing of free speech or at least the multiplicity of opinions on the platform of Twitter only aids in the acquisition of more data. The point is that the backside of X, X is just acquiring and filtering and processing more data. And if we censor and we, and we, if we keep kicking people off the platform, then we can't process their information. Again, what's the greatest sin is to disconnect or block the flow of data. We don't want to block the flow of data. He wants to create an everything app, right? X is going to be an app that's YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, um, your bank account. It's all that's going to be wrapped in one so that it can have access to the data. And that's what I see as Twitter. And so freedom is not for you. Freedom is not for the ability to move wherever you want to go. Freedom is for the data. And so he's explicit that paywalls, medical privacy, private communities, private property, the freedom of personal expression and freedom of movement is of the past. Those things are going away. You're not going to get it. Now it makes sense. Why, why, is the, why is Cleveland the first city in the United States that wants to do a 15-minute city? Huh. What is a 15-minute city? 15-minute city is one, again, it's moving the city onto the, the electric grid. Everything is data. Everything that can be processed. All the, all the, all the cameras, all the computers, all the security cam, All that stuff is giving data to the system. And so he says, for the pursuit of unrestricted data flow, he says this, limiting human expression and limiting human movement is essential. And so he says, if we're going to really have the freedom, the full freedom of information, the full acquisition of data, then what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to start limiting people's self-expression, the, the people's freedom of speech. Because for him, this stuff is just in the way. Because whether you want to do something or not want to do something, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And so he says that uh, restricting human movement is absolutely going to be part of the future. He says you're not going to own a you're not going to own a private vehicle because that affords you too much ability to move about however you want. What we're going to have are vehicles that are for rent. And so he talks about how he drives 30 minutes to the university there in Tel Aviv where he lives with him and his husband. And he says, yeah, I, I have a car, but I only drive for 30 minutes. And then the car sits in a parking lot for all day. And then I drive 30 minutes home in the future. What's going to happen is you're not going to be able to own a car. You're going to get on an app and say, Hey, I got to get from X to 
Y and the car is going to come pick you up. You're going to get in it. It'll drive you to point B and then um, you'll get out and it'll go pick somebody else up. And when you get off work, you'll have to, again, it's like a, it's going to be an AI driving system, basically Uber. And he says, well, what this will do is right now we have 1 billion cars on the planet and this is contributing to climate change. And therefore, what we need is if we have if, if there are if there is no such thing as private car uh, ownership, well, then we can rent cars and we can take 1 billion vehicles down to 50 million, 1 billion down to 50 million vehicles. And this is going to be good for the environment. And this is really good for you, too. Because again, those, those vehicles, they're all going to be electric. They're all going to be on the system. They're all going to be on the grid. And they're all going to be, uh, again, putting out more and more data, more information. And so he says, like I told you, there will be no financial incentive for you for the, the, uh, the privateering of information. If you create uh, a, you know, some type of video information or you create a book, it's going to have to be for free because all information must be accessed by the system. And so people will be required to put all info into the internet of all things, to track outbreaks, to predict um, trends, to conduct medical and economic research. So he says that, yeah, once this gets all going and once, once you know, the, the AI system really is in process, you're not going to have a choice whether you want to put your data, uh, your DNA sequence into the system or whether you want your uh, your public health passport to be. You don't have a choice. What are you talking about? There is no again, because you're not humanism, even though it rejected the pre preeminence of God in favor of man, it still gave man all these rights. There are no rights in the future because all you are is a biological processing of data.